Last year we did an Onyx solo run in Pokemon Red and Blue, and to keep this brief, it left a lot to be desired. Now chief among Onyx's shortcomings are the multiple double weaknesses, and the worst thing about the run was the abysmal 45 base attack that made challenges really tough to overcome. So what if you took Onyx and you let it evolve, you took away that pesky rock topping, and you added in that fresh new overpowered Gen 2 steel topping? On paper, it sounds like it would be a fairly formidable run, but not so fast my friends. Today we'll be taking a look at Steelix in a Pokemon Crystal solo run, and let's go over a few things. For the stats, one of the things Onyx had going for it was it was actually pretty fast with 70 base speed, but like I kind of alluded to in the Gramble run, Game Freak seemed to love giving these new Gen 2 Pokemon awful speed. Here it's slashed by over half, and base 30 speed, it doesn't exactly inspire confidence. Its attack stat is improved over Onyx, but at the end of the day, 85 just isn't groundbreaking. And when you look at the rest of the stats, they range anywhere from mediocre to bad, and you can definitely tell that they put all of this Pokemon stat budget into that massive defense stat. But this isn't Steelix's only upfront problem, and the most worrying thing is going to be this learn set. Now let's just focus upfront on the level up learn set, and I'm going to make a bold statement. I'm going to say that this is worse than Onyx's Gen 1 learn set, and that's kind of hard to do. The most notable thing here is just like the lack of stab moves specifically Earthquake, it's just not very good. Now as for the TMs, you can see that it's even more limited. Iron Tail, it's got stab, but it's not reliable. And outside of a stabbed Earthquake and the old Gen 2 staple return, you just don't really have that much to work with. And this isn't a Steelix specific problem, but the lack of Rock Slide as a TM in Gen 2 really hurts here as well, because I think the one-two punch of Earthquake and Rock Slide just provides some of the best coverage in the game, and it's gonna be missed today. And the last thing I'm gonna mention is that likes and comments really help the channel grow the most and this week let's focus on the likes if you want to help the channel out whether you are someone new maybe someone who just doesn't normally care about that sort of thing or if you are a returning subscriber like Carl let's pump up those likes this week if you look down and it's not at 500 I would greatly appreciate just a second of your time to do that and if you want to comment just for the algorithm tell me how you think Steelix is gonna do today or just tell me what you think about Steelix in general personally I love the design and I really like the Pokemon so I was kind of excited to deep dive into it today. But with that out of the way, I think we can all just sit back, relax, grab a sodi pop, and we can see how this one plays out. Right from the start, things are pretty standard, straightforward. I do not battle any wild Pokemon. And before we get into the why of that, let's just take a look at the first rifle battle. Now, I did give him Totodile for today, just because it's the only starter that has super effective damage. And like I always say, the rival really doesn't matter. He's kind of irrelevant outside of the couple of early fights. But here we do have to utilize Screech, and you can see kind of early already that it's taking kind of a lot to take it out, even with the Screeches. It's not great, but we'll return to this later. From there, I named my rival triple exclamation bar just because I'm so excited to do this run for you guys. And once again, I almost, I don't know what it is guys, I almost forget Professor Elm once again. Whenever I press record on Pokemon Crystal, my brain goes to mush. I can play three runs and do it perfectly, but as soon as I record it, I just forget. It is what it is. I need to stop showing this. I'm just kind of embarrassing myself. We talked about not grinding wild Pokemon earlier, and it's the simple fact that Steelix is kind of weak. It takes multiple tackles to take them down and it's just a little slow, but on our way to Violet City, I am picking up pretty much every battle that I can. Uh, things like Youngster Joey, Bugcatcher Don, things you would normally skip if you had a competent Pokemon, but we're doing this for the extra levels, and when we're done with all that, we can go ahead and take a look at Sprout Tower. Now normally, you'll come in here, you'll do the bare minimum path, and that'll get you a couple of extra levels and get you ready for Faulkner, but that's not the case today. There are a couple of extra sages that you normally would skip, but I am picking them up today, and you can see we hit level 12 at the end here, but we're not quite done yet. When that's over with, I do peek into the gym real quick to fight the underling trainers, and this is just so I know exactly how much experience I need when I go grind, because it's time for wild Pokemon grinding, and when you're grinding wild Pokemon before the first gym, that's usually not a great sign. To the west of Violet City, you can go ahead and pick up the hard stone here from Arthur. Now, it doesn't do anything for us just yet, but it's nice to have, and uh, Steelix, he kind of has a neck, but I decided to put the hard stone around his tail 
today. Uh, tell me what you think about that in the comments below. While we get into this grinding, we're not going to take a look at all of it. I think we should just talk about Faulkner for a second. So what's the reason for this extra grinding? It's because we are steel type, which means we are weak to ground, and that means Faulkner, our good old buddy Faulkner, is going to prioritize Mud Slap. Every time he hits us, it's going to lower our accuracy, and it's gonna we're going to be in for a bad time. I tried this a lot. You might think maybe with Tackle at level 13 you can do it, but I mean, once you start getting that accuracy, it just starts compounding on itself. You get hit with a couple of Mud Slaps, you start missing a lot, you get hit with a couple of more, then all of a sudden you can't hit to save your life. So the goal here, and when we finally hit 14 at the end of this tunnel, is Rock Throw. Now this isn't your mom and dad's red and blue Rock Throw where it's one of the worst moves in the entire game. This is a 90% accurate, 50 base power move, and with the Hard Stone, it does hit pretty hard, and I think it does the job quite well. But that's enough time lollygagging around, I think we can finally just take a look at Faulkner. And if I had infinite amount of time and resources to show you guys every practice battle I did, you would see how miserable this was without Rock Throw. And as expected, even though we have um, abysmal base speed, we can still outspeed a weak little Pidgey. One Rock Throw, all it takes. Now as for the Pidgeotto, it's a speed tie. Wouldn't you know that it does go first? It gets off the Mud Slap, but thankfully it doesn't matter. A Rock Throw can't one shot, but a follow up tackle can take it out. And that's the badge, just like that. Now, there might be a faster way to beat Faulkner. You could try to luck it out and keep resetting until you beat him, but I don't like to do that. I'm kind of on a clock here. I would rather go for the consistency on a real-time run so I don't have to do this thing like 10 times. Now, we do learn Mud Slap here. Uh, it's definitely needed. And what's so bad about Mud Slap, why I hate this move so much, is that even with Stab bonus from being a ground type, it's still weaker than Tackle. And just think about that for a second. I know it has the accuracy lower, but who cares? We don't have to really take a look at Union cave. I know I dunk on Mud Slap a lot, but it's a pretty useful move if you have to have it, especially when you're as limited as Steelix is. And as for Hacker Anthony, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I just throw mud in the face of this Machop. He can't even hit a low kick on me, and we get past no problem. We'll see you on the next cross-gen run, Hacker Anthony. As for the second gem, Bugsy and his little bugs don't stand the chance, because Rock Throw is pretty good, as you would expect against Bug Tops. It's doubly super effective against Scyther, and considering the fact that we have the hard stone it doesn't matter if we only had one speed we're still gonna win this one because we resist all of his moves and i think we can keep moving on now let's talk about shopping for a second i know it's so exciting and fun but here we usually buy enough escape ropes to last us to the end of the game and i usually talk about how bad dig is we'll get to that more in a second but i'm only buying one escape rope instead of the usual eight and something i found through my practicing of steelix is just how many extra potions you need to avoid healing so i'm buying a whopping 12 super potions here today and then now let's take a look at the next challenge of the run and with rival number two you're kind of just letting jesus take the wheel a little bit if you get hypnosis put on you turn one the ghastly can just kind of do whatever he's not going to kill you himself but he will kind of annoy you and just stall out the time overall one much slap will take it out so it's not too bad the crocodile and its super effective damage is where things get dicey and through lots of practice sometimes i was here a little bit earlier level uh just kind of lucky my way past Faulkner in some of my test runs. This one was worse, but with level 20, it's not that bad. Now, it's kind of cheesy here. I do use Mud Slap a good bit, and I lower its accuracy, and I kind of rely on it missing moves rather than the skill of Steelix itself. It's a little bit luck-based, but you gotta do what you gotta do when you're a really slow steel worm, you know? And once you can get past that threat, there's just a Zubat in the back, and we've already established that Rock Throw isn't that bad in Gen 2. It can one-shot it. We can kind of move on with our life and pretend that Steelix is going to have a good run. As far as Ilex Forest goes, there's really only one thing to mention, and that's the addition of Headbutt. It's just a doubly strong tackle, and it's going to help out a lot. And after doing the usual errands in Goldenrod, we can take our weekly, or I guess monthly, shout out to Juggler Irwin, holding it down out here, level 2 Voltorb. What kind of madman has a level 2 Voltorb after the third gym? Ask yourself that, and then tell me you don't have respect for this man. Now, my 
my friends, let's talk about Dig. I know in previous episodes, I said if you're using a good Pokemon, that you will never need Dig just because escape ropes are more efficient and Dig's just overall nerf. It's not really that good and most runs don't need it. But here, I speculated before, I said, what kind of run's gonna need Dig? And we're looking at it today. We're gonna need it. This is why I didn't need all those escape ropes earlier because for the, like, you don't get Earthquake to the very end of the game. So we're gonna be relying on Dig. I hate it, but 9D effective power with Stab isn't too bad and it's just necessary to help Steelix get over the hump in a few of these battles. This does mean we have to waste some time going out of our way to get it, but you kind of got to do what you're going to do in some of these runs. And after going ahead and picking up Return for future use, I think it's time just to take a look at Whitney. And this one's not really too bad. A normal top trainer with a bunch of normal moves. We pretty much resist everything just because Steel, especially Gen 2 Steel Top, was really overpowered, so we resist everything. We have massive defense stats. We take out everything quick and what you want here is maybe to the mill tank to lock itself into rollout but I keep using dig and when I dig underground it misses the rollout and resets it and what ends up happening it's kind of a mistake I let it start to get off milk drinks and it kind of stalls this one out I'm in no danger of losing but it's just kind of wasting time and at the end of the day this one isn't too bad it's just a little slow and we can just kind of move on we took the very slow national park route the first time and the next time we're leaving up to go to Ecritique I am taking the other path this means I will be picking up rollout. We don't really need it right now, but it will be helpful at certain points in the run. And I want you guys to look at this Kimono Girl fight. I'm guessing the combination of this Espeon only knowing resisted damaging moves and the fact that Sand Attack is ground, it just spams it. Now luckily this battle doesn't last eight hours, but it's very annoying and just a reminder of why I kind of hate these Kimono Girls. From there, Rival number three and Morty are both kind of a challenge. They're a little bit tricky, so I'm going to head west and I'm going to start taking the path down to Olivine. Now here, I'm going to be battling every single trainer on the route, and I'm also going to be picking up the Mint Berry just in preparation for Hypnosis on the Morty fight. Down in Olivine, I go ahead and do things like shop for my Super Repels, I pick up a good rod, then I go ahead and I catch my Krabby to use three HMs on later, and I go ahead and I pick up the HM for Strength here, and with a couple of Ethers if you need them, or just really good PP management, you can go ahead and take out the Lighthouse, now I do pick up a couple of extra trainers here just to hit a couple of breakpoints uh, to maybe hit an extra level a little earlier. And it's really important that you don't heal here just to save a little bit of time. Because when you're all finished up, you dig out of the lighthouse, you can just use Abra and teleport right back to Ecritique and you can save yourself a little bit of time. Now we can take a look at rival number three and we'll talk about some mistakes that I made. Now first up is the Haunter. He outspeeds me. It goes for a turn one curse and we're kind of on the clock already. Now, now I use Dig, I take some damage, and then the Crocodile comes in, and you can kind of see my mistake. Dig is a two turn move, so I'm pretty much taking double the curse damage that I should be taking, as well as a little bit of super effective water chip damage, and when it's all said and done, I'm down to 10 HP, things aren't looking too good. There's really not a chance, but just to make it a little bit more poetic, when the Zubat comes in, I do miss a rock throw, and I get knocked out to the curse. And that's the first reset of the run. And on the second attempt, I do learn from my mistakes. It's going to use curse anyway so just use mud slap save yourself a turn don't take any unnecessary damage from the curse because mud slap's just gonna do the same job and on the crocodile just take the damage now that you have whitney's badge headbutt does more damage on a per turn basis than dig if you're any good at math at all and doing the highest amount of damage per turn is your best route to go and you can see how much more healthy we are on this attempt as far as the zubat goes i do miss another rock throw and we're getting kind of low but thankfully i don't miss and Mud Slap is a one shot on the Magnemite as well so we don't have to go for Dig and take any more curse damage so we take this one. It was a little annoying but I think it was more of a self-made mistake rather than the, a fault of Steelix and I do think it's important to admit that to yourself sometimes because bad play or just you know poor foresight can cost you a reset and sometimes it's easy just to blame it on the Pokemon but that's not really the case so far. And before we gear up for the fourth gym I do equip that Mint Berry we picked up earlier and let's see if some of that extra training paid off.
Gasly comes in, we do outspeed here. With our ground topping, there's no question that this is a one shot, we can move on. Hunter is next, and I wanna go for the more powerful dig, but it is faster, so I'm afraid it's gonna curse, but it doesn't. Instead, it just goes for a nightshade. It does all right damage, I get off the dig, and when the next Hunter comes in, it goes for hypnosis, but thankfully it misses. Even if it didn't, we still had the mint berry. One dig takes it out as well. Finally up is the Gengar. It just goes for mean look, but I'm sorry, bud, we don't have any plans of escaping today we dig underground we deal the finishing blow and just like that we take the fourth gym and i will say that when you do some runs you learn a lot of things this goes for any game that i play but with gramble i learned the value of just going out of order and it really helped with chuck and once again we are weak to fighting so i'm making my way over to the lake of rage and something happened on this run that really surprised me it's pretty cool uh tell me what you guys think down below but i have a super repel going and you go down in this grass to avoid this trainer right here and as soon as I stepped into the grass I got a wild encounter and I was like what's happening and it turns out it's a Raikou so we encountered a legendary uh, it's a first for me very cool sprite I have been thinking about doing some of the legendary beast runs I really wanted to do Suicune but maybe Raikou appearing here is just kind of like an omen what I should do later now I don't have any plans uh, this is probably the last crystal run for a couple of months but the point being before I get off track here it was just kind of cool I thought it was a neat addition and I had to show it in the footage. As for the Lake of Rage, we have not really talked about hidden power yet, but it is flying. This is very similar to the Tyranitar run. Now we're not times four weak to flying, but Steelix is just a little bit weak and I do need to utilize it just to get comfortably past Chuck today. And let me just kind of go on a soapbox real quick, a real quick rant, what I hate about hidden power. And just something that I think that Game Freak, they had no like foresight to really think about this because your attack and your defense DVs determine the hidden power power's top and if your attack is at 15 and you lower your defense every kind of hidden power that you can get is all special you would think that all of those tops would be physical moves since it requires you to have 15 attack to use them but you have to lower your attack two points to 13 to even to start to get to the physical uh, top kind of moves like ground rock etc you guys know what it is and even though the dvs really don't make that much different stat wise it just it doesn't really make sense why do i need to have 12 in attack to get flying when it should be the other way around maybe like 15 in attack to get some of them 14 for the rest of them and then 13 attack and 12 attack gonna be for the special moves since they don't even use attack anyway that's just a little mini rant i'm gonna stop talking about it and if that doesn't make any sense it's like 30 minutes past my bedtime so cut me some slack please Next up, I do the rocket hideout early. It's just one of those things I learned from Gramble. I just talked about it. Uh, it's not really interesting. We don't need to go into it. The extra levels just help when we go through some of Steelix's harder challenges. It just helps out. Next up, we're doing something a little bit more out of order. Now, I'm not really ready to face Price yet. I guess I am because I do it. But what I'm trying to say is that it's a little bit tough, but you just need a little bit more extra levels. And I will be facing all six of his underling trainers. Now here you can see that I get really low low in this fight against the shelters and the cloister it's kind of an annoying fight but it's kind of like a microcosm of how every fight in this gym is you're kind of weak you take a lot of damage but this is the reason why we bought all of those super potions earlier so we can just not have to go heal constantly and remember guys for this lake of rage rocket hideout segment i'm trying not to heal at the pokey center so i can just warp back or teleport back to ecritic to save a little time overall i do have to use some ethers here but it's fine we make it through and now we can just look at Price real quick. And a lot of people goof and gaff on Price. They talk about how weak he is. Now, Seal, Seal is one of the worst Pokemon. I'll give you that. We don't really have a great answer for it. And our PP's running a little bit low. But we can't just take it down. It can't really do much to us. Now, as for the Dugong, it's a little bit stronger. But it's new ice subtopping that it gets when it evolves. Make it weak to rock throw. And we can make pretty short work of it. Now, we're not weak to ice. It's just neutral damage. But the Pilo Swine having access to Blizzard is a problem and just like we did with our old friend hiker anthony i utilize the old-fashioned mud slap strategies and i lower that dude's accuracy and that means he's never going to hit a blizzard on us he's never going to get a victory and today we keep cruising along overall i guess it's kind of unique for me so far to do the seventh gym right now or i guess what is supposedly the seventh gym in order but it really wasn't that bad and there's a lot of problems with gen 2 uh, a lot of people call out its flaws a lot but i think that the open 
openness when you start to get towards that mid game is one of the things I like a lot. For me personally, Gen 1, when you make it to Celadon, I think that's the best part of the game. There's so many options for you to do and that's what makes it still fun for me. And it's kind of similar here, especially as I play and I learn the map a little bit better. I like the options you get sort of in that mid game. Now, after we get out of there, I do teleport like I just mentioned and we have not healed since Ecritique. We save a little bit of time and now we backtrack. And before we hop on our little crabby to surface down, I am going to be picking up the sharp beak this week. And no, I did not mean to rhyme right there, but it's going to be helpful. You've seen this strategy in the Tyranitar video and you already know kind of what's coming. And after that, the only thing left to say is that we're taking a brisk swim down to Cyanwood. And this week, swimmer Kaylee actually sees us, but we're not going to show her battle today. Before I go into the gym, I equip the sharp beak. I want you to look at how absurd this looks on the, the overlay here, but that aside, I do learn hidden power. We already mentioned it's flying type. We have Faulkner's badge. This means it is at 86 effective power. We don't need to show any of the underling trainers. And now we can just take a look at Chuck, brother. And there's really not much to say about this fight. The new strategies that I have picked up means that it's just two one-shots. That's all there is to say about it. One of the tougher battles, you equip the sharp beak, you get hidden power flying, you do some extra grinding early, and here we are. I guess this is just the fruits of our labor paying off, and I'll take it. Now Steelix is going to have some new things that we have not seen in other runs. We need some help, and the first thing I do before we even use fly to go anywhere is I'm taking a little, uh, another brisk swim today. We're going to the sea foam islands if you can believe that it doesn't take too much time but inside of here there is a hidden rare candy and i'm gonna need a couple extra of those today so i just picked that up from there i go to the right of new bark town i pick up the rare candy you normally wouldn't look at until you're going to the elite four but i do need it a little bit early today next up i'm going left of new bark town on the first route it's tuscany tuesday we're picking up the pink bow a little bit earlier just because we need a little extra power for our little steelix boy and honestly guys, I never get tired of the pink bow on the overlay. It's my favorite held item to look at and to put on a Pokemon when I'm making these uh, images up to play the game with. From there, we got the standard Violet City pickups, the rare candy, the PP up, who cares? Now let's get to some new stuff. South of Goldenrod, we pick up the nugget and the rare candy. That's just standard. But if you get back on your surf user and go down, there's like this little hidden coven of cool trainer females that are just gathered around there. They all have water tops, so that is kind of annoying but at this point you over level them by a lot so it's really not that much of an issue the point being here when you're done with all three of them kate will give you the soft sand it's just the held item that increases the power of ground moves and it's going to be helpful in a few spots but it's definitely one of the weirdest ways that you get a top boosting held item in this game it's it's got to be the most unique and I do make immediate use of it. I go ahead and I equip it when we're about to take a look at Jasmine here. And the only thing it really does for us in this specific situation is it makes Steelix a guaranteed two hit. I don't think it's 100% guaranteed, but it's pretty close. It really smooths out the ranges for Dig to hit a little bit harder here. Now this fight wasn't hard by any stretch of the imagination considering that we're immune to Thunder Waves from the Magnemite. But if you can just make something a little bit faster, there's no reason to not do it. But anyway, that's all the badges down and now we get that dreaded phone call that we have to do even more rocket battles. And thanks to the magic of video editing, you don't have to see a single one of them. Now we can take a look at our vitamin buy for the run. I guess it's worth noting real quick that this is the part of the game where you learn return. A little bit earlier than this, probably before the rocket tech out segment, it starts to outclass things like headbutt. And we do have quite a good bit of money today, so I'm able to afford three proteins, four carbos for speed to help out, and three calcium just to help out with special. Now I had like a bit of an existential crisis here. I was like, Gen 2 has special defense, so maybe I should be buying zinc. Is zinc a thing? Have I been messing up? And it turns out that calcium still just do the same thing they did in Gen 1, even though there is special defense now. So I felt pretty good. But I had like a out of body experience for a minute thinking that I was doing something wrong this whole time for months. Now there's only one gym left, but there's still a lot of room left for training and we're gonna need it. Now on Route 45, 
before, before we go into Ice Cave, I'm battling every single thing in this area because believe it or not guys, we don't have anything for Claire and it was a really, really tough battle, which is something you don't really hear too often, but Kingdra was just really hard to deal with and we'll talk about, you know, what I did for that, but all you need to know for now is I battled everything I could leading up to it. Now this didn't really go as I planned it. I wanted to use rare candies a little bit earlier than I did, but extra battles that I accidentally ran into that I wasn't supposed to fight pushed my experience to some weird ranges, so I had to make some changes on the fly. The reason why I went to Seafoam, the reason why I went to the ride of uh, New Bark Town to get that rare candy earlier was because you need to use a ton and you don't have enough if you're just following the standard route that I usually do. For the purposes of this run, after I fought Cool Trainer Cody, I hit level 50 and from there I go ahead and I use 5 rare candies to get to level 55. That damage rounding threshold there is absolutely pivotal. And I guess we should just take a look at Claire and find out why that is. The first thing that the rare candies do is it puts these Dragonairs into guaranteed two-shot ranges. Now you could do this at a lower level. The Dragonairs, they're not really the issue though. They don't really matter. It's the Kingdra. Even if you max out the stat experience you can use with your vitamins, you'll underspeed this thing naturally. So you need to at least be about level 54 and then you'll have a chance. Level 55 with a damage rounding threshold means it's a pretty comfortable two-shot. You can see we do a ton of damage to it here. It does use a hyper potion, but before before, this fight was pretty much like this. You're undersped, you get served, you take a ton of damage, you can't two-shot it with return to retaliate, so you'll take three serves and you will die. So it was a really, really tough fight, which is kind of surprising because Claire is really just a speed bump. It's a formality at this point in the game, and it felt kind of refreshing to see it require a little bit of strategy and planning here. But outside of that, we've already covered the Dragonairs. The other two are exactly the same. They go down in one hit, but I thought it was pretty cool that Claire was was actually kind of a challenge and required me to do some extra routing and planning. I'm all for that kind of stuff. I'm a nerd when it comes to that stuff. What do you think this wise old dragon sage would think if he's like, oh yes, you've proven yourself. Here's this very rare exclusive move Dratini here. And you're just like, yeah, cool, I'll take it. And you just teach it waterfall, never use it. And it's just a HM mule for the rest of its life. I just, for me, that's just hilarious. I don't know. Going towards the Elite Four, I do battle pretty much every trainer on the way there because we need a couple of extra levels and we've already used up a huge stock of our rare candy so I can't really afford to use any more. But I will spare you guys from showing all these pretty trivial battles. We can skip over the final rival. It doesn't matter. And I think now we can start to take a look at the Elite Four. First up is Wheel, and if there was ever any struggle going on before this, using five rare candies to get past Claire really smoothed out things in the future down the road, and it's really evident here on Wheel. Now pretty much return is about a one shot on everything. Uh, our superior defensive topping that Steel gives us means that we're really safe here, and overall there's not much to really talk about. This one's quick, we can kind of just move on to Koga. And surprise surprise, this one is uh, pretty easy as well. Rock Rock Throw is really good for this fight, but when the Ferretress comes out, uh, I guess it's time to mention that I did pick up Earthquake in the Victory Road. I didn't mention that, but it's easily our best move. Now, side tangent for this, this, this battle doesn't matter. It's over really easy. You can just watch the sped up footage in the background, but a stabbed Earthquake is kind of like the one exception in Gen 2 to where it's something that's just overall just straight up better than Return. 150 effective power with Stab is pretty amazing, and then if you put on something like the soft sand which I get the feeling we'll see very soon it just gets that much better as for Bruno we might be weak to fighting moves but we have a sharp beak and we have hidden power flying and that means things are gonna be pretty easy here I'm just gonna reiterate I'll say this I think I said it last episode but Hitmon top is pathetic absolutely he's like the Tangela of generation 2 I think that Pokemon's really bad and as long as I'm just having fun doing gen 2 runs I probably never want to touch that Pokemon it's awful but this one's 
over quick. Even the Machamp's a one shot with the hidden power flying and the sharp beak. And we have Earthquake for that final little onyx he's trying to hide in the back. And this one's just a done deal. Next up is Karen, and I do have the soft sand equipped for this fight. And let's see what Steelix can do against an Umbreon. Earthquake honestly does pretty impressive damage, even though it doesn't one hit. But unfortunately, I do get hit with the sand attack before I take it out on the following turn. And even though there's scary things like the Houndoom hiding in the back here with like a potential flamethrower, I actually go on to never miss. And you might be wondering, hey, how do you not miss with sand attack? And if you didn't know, generation one so brutal with sand attack, you get hit once, your accuracy goes from 100% to 66%. But in gen two forward, it goes from 100% to 75%, which means you just have a pretty good chance to hit still. And here, I rolled the dice. I got pretty lucky. I didn't miss. And we don't have to worry about any bothersome resets with Karen today. Before we fight the champion, there are a couple of adjustments I need to make. The first one is I put on the hard stone once again, and we're going to be replacing rock throw with rollout. It was the only way that I could effectively get past this fight without grinding or using extra rare candies, and I think we should just take a deeper look into it. For this fight to be comfortable, it needs to go a certain type of way. On this first attempt, it does not go that way. Now what happens is we start to set up rollout and the Gyarados goes for surf, which chips us down. It doesn't do a ton, but it does quite a good bit. This means when the Charizard comes in next, it's a speedy little lizard. It gets off a flamethrower and we're really low even though we one shot it. Now from there, you start to notice the one shots and you're probably thinking, well, you're probably just fine anyway, but rollout is eventually going to end it's gonna go back to its weakened state and when the champion brings in his blizzard dragon knight it can survive the very weak first stage of rollout it gets a blizzard off and that's another reset honestly two resets not that bad so far and I'll say that the other reset was probably more my fault than it was just the game on the second attempt let's take a look at what's supposed to happen you start up your rollout Gyarados uses rain dance he doesn't hit you at all then you take it out on the next turn now since he set up rain dance that means when the Charizard comes into Flamethrower, it's going to be weakened as well from the rain, and you're going to take that out as well. And from there, since you save so much health, you can tank multiple blizzards like I do, but it just doesn't matter. You can use rollout until it runs out, one-shot everything, then you can set up another rollout and keep one-shotting stuff there. Even if you get really bad luck and make it to the Aerodactyl, it's not going to be able to take you out because Steelix has about 8,000 defense, and it can only do resisted damage to you. So one reset, not too bad. You do need kind of like a certain little string of events to make this one pretty easy but with only one reset it's not really that hard to get and just like that, the champion's down and the Johto region is over with. Now this run is a little bit slower. You might have noticed I've complained about it a lot. We ended the champion with a time of one hour, 15 minutes and about 45 seconds. So we're quite a bit, but about 20 minutes behind our fastest runs, but it was to be expected. Even though it's a little bit slower, I think our routing has came together pretty well. Two resets isn't that bad. I felt like it was pretty consistent and I guess we can see where the Kanto region takes us next so let's fade to black and let's see what happens there And before we just dive straight into Kanto, there is one last stop before I get on the SS Aqua. We're going to be going to Mount Mortar. Now that we have Waterfall, a couple of things have opened up for us. And once again, this is something I normally do not do for my runs. I simply just never need these rare candies. And this one, it honestly isn't too bad to get. It only takes like, what, like 20 seconds of time to get. Now there is another item that I'm after. It's a little bit more out of the way. And even though I'm not gonna be using it for the timed portion of my run I will be using it on the red fight and you still got to prepare for that but defense curl with rollout it'll be pretty much something we're relying on for that fight just spoiler alert I guess and as for the badges in Kanto there's no surprise that most of the things here are pretty trivial but there was a couple of hiccups that we'll just cover kind of real quick first up is Misty and through my practice I had this one on the radar and there was a simple solution but I simply I was just going as fast as I could I never really take Kanto too seriously I didn't have the right set up here.
here. So what ends up happening is a return does not knock out the Lapras. And for the first time ever in any run I've pretty much ever done of Pokemon, I get knocked out. I have a reset here, but it's due to Parish Song. Now Parish Song puts a little counter on you. If it goes down to zero, you get knocked out. No questions asked. And that's what happens here. Uh, pretty funny, I guess, but that's a reset. Now, if you're curious, what you're supposed to do for this fight is use Soft Sand and Earthquake, and it puts Lapras in a guaranteed one-shot range, and it makes this fight pretty easy. It was another one of those kind of self-made blunders. And up next, we have Blaine. Now, if you notice on the, the little PP meter at the top left, I just wasn't paying attention to how many Earthquakes I had here. I run out. That means I'm not as strong. The fact that I have to set up Rollout means he's able to set up a Sunny Day, and by the time I make it to the very fast Rapid Dash that's definitely faster than us, it gets off a super powered fire blast and that's yet another reset and before i take on blue i do deposit all of my other pokemon because at the end of the day if he starts to use roar it can be really annoying and really stall out the fight so i just go ahead and do this now just to save me some time potential time later And the name of the game for this fight is to set up a nice little rollout here. I probably should have the hardstone on, but I don't. We resist everything the Pidgeot has, and it can't use Gust on us to reset our rollout count. So we set up a nice little rollout and we start rolling. Luckily, even though the Gyarados barely outspeeds us, it only sets up Rain Dance. And a third tick of rollout means we just crush it instantly. And this rollout keeps going all the way through the Alakazam. Now, luckily, it does not set up reflect and it runs out right when we get to the Rhydon. We got a super effective earthquake for this Rhino. That means we take it out and as for the Arcanine, it goes for some move that has decreased priority. I haven't really deep dove into it, but we go first even though we're outsped and one earthquake does it. And that's our final Kanto Gym. Now I will say this is at the very end of the road here. It sucks for ground types that the very last badge, the 16th badge when the game's essentially over is what you need to get that 12.5% increased badge, but it is what it is. Now, overall, Steelix finishes his blue split with a time of 1 hour, 34 minutes, and 32 seconds. Now, needless to say, it's pretty slow. We're nearing about 25 to 30 minutes slower than my fastest run, but it's about time we get one of these in the middle runs where it's not as extreme, where it's like, oh, I had the fastest run ever this week, or you have like an Iggly Buff run that's two hours. So it's nice to have some middle ground here. Overall, I enjoyed it, but if you're wondering, I time my runs at blue because if you want to beat red in a timely manner, you're just going to use curse and rest. I despise that strategy. It's boring to watch. It's boring to play, and I guess now there's only one thing left to do, and we're going to talk about red and ultimately go over what you would need to do to make this fight kind of consistent, and strap yourself in because this, it, it made my head hurt. This one wasn't very good. It was actually probably, this was a worse red fight than Iggly Buff. Now, granted, I was using curse for the iggly buff run but let's just let's just get into it going into the red fight i use all of my rare candies that i have left that gets us to level 75 and here we're going for some sort of weird strategy a defense curl can increase the counter of rollout by plus one so you start out at plus two rather than plus one if you don't know the mechanics of that look it up on bulbapedia those along with a stabbed earthquake and a rest to heal up when we get a little break in the middle of the fight seem like the best strategy of the top of my head. Now remember, I did not test this that much since I don't really count red into my final time, but let's just kind of take a look. And on the Pikachu, I'm going to go ahead and say, I say this a lot, if you're an attack based Pokemon and you get charmed on turn one, just save yourself the trouble, reset, because this is the most toxic and oppressive move in the game. Now here, luckily, it just misses, and we do have Earthquake. It doesn't matter, we could one-shot this, but we're never going to be able to outspeed Pikachu. Keep that in mind, let's move on to the Espeon. Now here, in a perfect world, it would set up Reflect, and you would kind of, you know, maybe rest, maybe set up some defense curls, tank some hits, and you would time the rollout perfectly to where when you make it to the Venusaur it's just now fading and you have like a plus three or plus four rollout going into that and you can just kind of ride that momentum to the next couple of Pokemon. Now the problem here and you always knew it would be is that 30 base speed and the fact that red is so much higher level than any other trainer. This means you don't outspeed pretty much anything outside of the Snorlax and he's going to lock that thing at the very end of the battle and you're never going to see it because it only has resisted 
damage for you. I am going to show you a few attempts just going on in the background. You can kind of look at them and kind of see how it's going, but it's not going good. Now, my friends, we're going to skip ahead, and I don't want you to be alarmed because I try for quite some time, and the resets, they're really, 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 really going to jump up, okay? Let's jump ahead to a whopping level 95. We're over two hours in at 71 resets. It's pretty bad, okay? I know it's bad, but let's just talk about it real quick. Pikachu, who cares? You don't get charmed. You take it out in one hit. No one cares. As for the Espeon, I tried tons of things here to work. I was trying my Mint Berry, stalling with the Reflect, but at the end of the day, you just gotta accept the Reflect. You gotta embrace the Reflect. I just let it happen. I set up a Defense Curl, and by the time you make it to a plus three rollout, you can just go through the Reflect. It doesn't matter anymore. You need two rollouts remaining for the next two Pokemon, and the thing that level 95, there's two things that 95 allow you to do, and the first is that you outspeed the Venusaur. That means unless you miss rollout, you're gonna take it out because it's at plus four with the defense curl bonus at this point. So it's an easy one shot. And as for the Charizard, he has the plus five rollout just waiting on it. He's double weak to rock. Now at this point, if you followed the fight up to here, you're gonna be at enough health to where you can survive any move he goes for, but he does miss fire spin here. So that's even better for us. And the next thing that level 95 does is it lets you outspeed the Blastoise. And unfortunately, rollout is over with. Earthquake can't quite one shot it. But sir, honestly, it doesn't do that much damage and you should be able to tank one. And finally at the end, Red is trying to hide that Snorlax in the back because it cannot do anything to Steelix. And at this point, you've already proven everything that you needed to do and you can just take this thing out. And finally, finally, that's it. Over two hours of time, 71 resets, uh, we finally make it through. Now let me just reiterate for anybody that's new, uh, blue is the split time that we look at for runs that complete the entirety of the game. Red is a bonus. Now we do look back at the red times if there's close runs but one had a better red time it might help it on the tier list. Part of the fun for me is to figure out how you can do a consistent red fight without relying on curse and even though today was a little bit of a slog it was still pretty enjoyable. Now this one I don't have a tier list yet. I'm honestly exhausted. I mean look at these resets here. Uh, so I think I'm going to wrap it up real quick. A uh, special shout out to my channel members. I do appreciate the support. You guys are amazing and if you're hearing my voice right now you're a real one. I really appreciate you. Comment real one down in the comments so I know that you made it this far because you guys deserve some recognition for that because that viewer retention very important metric but I digress. I think that's it for me. Steelix I do like the Pokemon but I probably like them a little bit less now because this run it just wasn't that good and that's about all I have for you. I'll see you on the next one. Bye.